We've been talking about greatest conclusions about life, and we're talking about wealth. What is wealth? What is the true definition of wealth? That's what we're looking up to. And we ended by saying money stops nonsense. Please, I want to receive your SMS and your prayer request and your question and contribution through the number that is displayed on your screen. It's live, so you can participate, you can collaborate. Okay. All right. We are on, so if you want to send your, your text message I'm waiting to receive, I want to hear your participation, what you have to say as far as this is concerned. All right. We were talking about money stops nonsense. Let's look at Second Kings chapter 15. We're going to look at Second Kings chapter 15, verse number 20. Is your Bible there with you? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 20. Now, and Paul, the king of Assyria, came against the land. And Menahem gave Paul a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom of his hand. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, we see how, this is, if we get to international relations, this is money being used to determine another king's position and another king's influence, to keep his influence from a land and my interest is not even going too deep into the transaction that took place. There are many references I could make, but you hear, here it says, even of all the mighty men of wealth, all the mighty men of, so it needed the mighty men of wealth to show up for nonsense to be stopped. Praise God. So, this is the place of wealth when we say money stops nonsense. Now you can read that story out to get the best because of time. I may not go into share the depth of the account because it may derail. But money stops nonsense. Wealth stops nonsense. But when we get to Solomon, King Solomon, as wealthy as King Solomon was, let's not get moved by what we hear. King Solomon prayed a prayer. He said, Lord, Please, don't make me too rich. I will forget your laws. And neither make me too poor. I may also steal and disobey your commandments. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commands. So what does Solomon want? What is wealth? If the man who says vanity upon vanity says money answered all things and says, Lord, don't make me too rich, what then is wealth? Because this is one of the wealthiest kings the world has ever had. I don't want to go into the statistics of his riches. You can find out more research, get more of reports about the riches of King Solomon. You can Google that. So what is the conclusion about money? How much money do you need? You need enough money. What is enough money? As far as human life is concerned, there is something called covetousness. There is something called avarice. It's a passion, a human passion. We all have minds that think big and souls that dream big. And this was the same of those who built the Torah of Babel. They wanted to touch heaven. And God said, whatever this men imagine would be possible. 
And I've often said, on curb civilization, though civilization is the cradle of human betterment, on curb civilization is the grave of humans or man's accent to God. Civilization is the cradle for the betterment of our life, but it can also serve as the grave or the demise to everything we could ever enjoy. Because when we civilize or when we dream or when we imagine of God's course, of God's design, of God's command, it seems good. But to those who study or they do space science and they send rockets in projectiles to space, one degree of the right trajectory seems okay when you are still in the Earth's atmosphere. But as you launch further into space, you discover that you are completely off course. When we make decisions and when we dream of God's course, it sounds so right. It feels so good. But the more we go closer to the demands of God, the more we go closer to the reality of the values of, of, of life and of the demand of God, the more we find that we are estranged from Him. And so it is the desire for amassing of wealth, avarice, comes because of our desires and dreams and cravings. That's why Solomon said, please come back. You have a duty to fear God. Come back. There is no end to riches. He said, come back. Now when we follow, this was why Solomon prayed the prayer he prayed. And we come back to the days of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 24, Jesus was saying here, a rich man came to him and said, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, go and sell all your riches <laughs> and come. And the man said this was too hard. So Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which was a gate, not really the needle that we used to sew clothes. It was a gate that camels had to struggle to go through. Now, he said it's easier for a man to go through the, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Is Jesus saying a bad thing to be rich? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what he's saying. It, it was poor that we might be made rich. But this is the same prayer of Solomon. Don't make me too rich. In other words, Solomon was saying, please don't give my eyes and my heart to love after riches. The love of money is the root of all evil. We find that in 1 Timothy chapter 6 from verse 10. You see, this man loved his world. It meant so much to him. And he was so poor that all, his heart, all he had was his riches. So what is true riches? Because as, as we are going forward, we are going to define this wealth. There are two dimensions of wealth. The wealth that expires and the wealth that doesn't expire. I'm not preaching this word to you because I'm a poor man. I've tasted poverty, yes. I've lamented, yes. I've lived in lack. I've lived in want. And I've also seen when God meets my needs. I'm not giving this to you to make you comfortable in poverty. But let's look what is the conclusion. There is the parable of the rich fool who had amassed a lot of things for himself. And he said, it's time for him to sit and eat. And God said, today you will die. And a different person is going to eat all what you've labored for. And then I find Solomon again concluding in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from verse 11. He says, for a man to work and eat of the fruit of his labor is a gift from God. So, we are looking at wealth. If the love of money is the root of all evil, 
if wealth is needed to answer the question, where should we find ourselves? How much money do you need? In Colossians chapter 3, Apostle Paul said, set your eyes on things above, not on things below. Don't labor for the wealth that will perish, that moth will eat, and men of the underworld will attack. But labor for the wealth that can never perish. And Jesus is giving this same advice to his followers. So what truly can you, can you, can you see his wealth? Now the scripture makes us know that the king's wealth is in his land and his glory is in his people. And if we get to the sound philosophical conclusion of scripture, it says, more blessed is the hands that giveth than the hand that taketh. You are as rich, you are as wealthy as what you give, not what you have. You are as rich, you are as wealthy as what you give, not what you have. I'm not drawing my conclusion just from the philosophy. It's from scripture. And we are getting a man that is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. A prophet of old. In Jeremiah, he writes, presenting this to us. You are as rich as what you have. As what you give, not what you have. So many people pride themselves in how much money they have or how much world they think they have. Now, we are made known by scripture that says, more blessed is the hands that giveth than the one that taketh. The wealthy man is the man that dispenses and makes his land to be a blessing to his people. If you are wealthy, and the world is not a better place through you. You are a curse. The poor man takes. The rich man gives. Are you keeping your wealth? You die. You're going nowhere with it. It stays here. Wealth is what a man has to offer. Riches is what a man has to offer. Money is just a legal tender. You can have a pile of stacks of gold in your room. If you don't have anybody to exchange the gold for money, you are wealthy, but you have no money. <laughs> That's what wealth is. Wealth is the value with which you are endowed to offer for a point in time. Money is a physical evidence of the value that you have and doubt. So money answered all things. Wealth may stay, but if the value is not appreciated through money, it may not have, or through some form of exchange, or some form of confirmation of the value, you may not show your wealth. So there are many wealthy men, many wealthy believers, many wealthy people who have no money. And there are many rich people who have no wealth. So true riches, true riches has to do with wealth and money. I believe now we are getting a proper definition of wealth. You may have your definition about it, but this is the conclusion of scripture. A king's wealth is in his land. What your land has. What you have to offer to the people. What you have to offer to make life better for people is wealth. Your idea may be the wealth is in your land. Your body is the land. Remember scripturally, there is a parable of the sower who went to sow seed. The seed fell on land. And that land is you. And the seed is the word of God. You are a land. You are a land on which things have to be cultivated. Things have to be, to be planted. In fact, the earth or the cosmos itself is a reflection of the system of man. And so, the king's wealth is in his land. And let's move away from this to the conclusion of Solomon. Our last two episodes we talked about wisdom. Solomon said, wisdom is the capital thing. Proverbs chapter 4. Get wisdom in order getting, get understanding. By wisdom and houses built and by understanding its rooms are established. 
You may not have money, but you have wisdom. Wisdom tells you what to do at a point in time. Understanding shows you how to do when at a point in time. So you need wisdom and you need understanding to be able to make money if you don't have money to bring the resource. So nations need wise men, wise counselors who can be able to work with wisdom and with the wealth to bring in explosion of resources and to make the life of their people better. So you need wisdom as a capital. You need understanding to be able to express and manifest the capital. So, your wealth is what you are endowed with by God. The gift of the Holy Ghost is the greatest wealth a man can ever have. Money, you're going to leave it. I think we need to read scripture so that I don't get to only talk. Let's look at Malachi chapter 3 from verse 8. I'm not going to read because of time. Now, these people, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 always talks about tithe. From verse 12, the people were complaining that they give their tithe, they pay their tithe, they pay their offerings, they serve God. But there are men of the world who are getting rich. There are some who even tempt God and go free. Like some rich men who think that it's uh, brainwashing to be very committed to serve God in church. And there are some people who feel like I mean, some rich people or some mothers or parents who feel like maybe pastors are beggarly. It used to be. It still is in some places. This is a category of thought. These people were thinking that they have served God in vain because they didn't grow in riches. And then the Bible says from verse 17, God said, Ah, how can you people say these hurtful words against me? That's Malachi chapter 3. And God continues to point them towards the end of all things. God remembered them in their groaning, but God pointed them towards the conclusions of David. David said in Psalm 37 verse 8, from verse 4, he said, Fret not yourself because of the man who prospers in his evil ways. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to more trouble. When we begin to compare ourselves with men, we get to feel like we are poor. When you compare yourselves with other people, you feel like you are poor. But I want to say, getting to the conclusion, Jesus said, after food, after shelter, after wealth of this earth, Gentiles, people who don't know God, they seek. But you, Christians, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. We'll go on a break. We come back, and I give you the conclusion of all these two facets. And we are going to pray ferociously, and we know that we have had a good day. Please stay in tune. I'm coming back to give you some two proverbs. I'm coming back with two scriptures. Shortly, briefly, for about three minutes, give you the standard conclusion I think is going to be a big blessing to make you richer and to make you better and relate further in your accent with God. Stay tuned. Don't move away. We'll be back after the break. Mm -hmm. 